All the major news stories made simple and easy for your listening pleasure. We'll break it down for you in keywords. For the segment, we're joined by Adam in the studio. Good morning. Good morning, Lena. This week is just kind of flying by for me. Yeah? Yeah. I, I mean, think th- for me as well, I think. It's done by really quickly. I can't believe it's a Thursday already. It is Thursday. Can right? we yeah, say the is. cooler temperature makes it a little bit more bearable? Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. The mornings are getting a little bit better now. Still during the day, it's a bit hot, though. <laughs> yeah. Are you getting quality sleep, though? Uh, I never do. So I, I will continue to ask, and one of these days I'm going to get an answer that says, "Yeah, I, I did." Yeah. One I'm, of those days, uh, very few days that I I'm get well good rested, sleep. folks. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for joining us, Adam. I'm happy to be here. Let's jump into our keyword news segment. As always, we're going to hopefully try to clarify some of these major headlines for you, starting with our first pick of the day. Let's try that once more. Our first <laughs> keyword of the day. Job growth slows. Do you think our producer does it just to keep us like on our toes? Yeah, I think it's uh, one of those, you know, stay awake kind of things. I am <laughs> wide awake. Thanks for checking in us. All right, so let's start off with Korea's job market. Employment has been growing, but the pace of increase has been dwindling. So mm. what's the latest figures? Yeah, so according to Statistics Korea, the number of employed people reached just over 27.6 million last month. That's uh, 542,000 more than a year earlier. Uh, the July additions were lower than an on-year increase of 582,000 the previous month. Now, amid an economic recovery, the country has reported job additions since March when 314,000 jobs were added on-year. That was actually the first job growth in 13 months. Uh, But the job growth has slowed for the third straight month in July amid the latest resurgence in COVID-19 cases. Uh, But Finance Minister Hong Nam-gi said the impact of the toughest ever virus curbs will be felt on jobs data from August. So um, the numbers are not expected to be any better, unfortunately. Mm. Now, the fourth wave of the pandemic is dealing a blow, as we know, to jobs, especially in in in-person service sectors. Uh, The accommodation and food service segment reported job losses last month after the third straight month of gains, in fact, uh, with an on-year fall of 12,000 jobs. The arts, sports and leisure sector saw jobs decline around 28,000 on year. So it is very segment and industry specific. Mm. Um, But as a whole, uh, the jobs are recovering, but not as fast as many would like. All right. We're going to take a look at the country's COVID figures next. This is our second keyword of the day. Worst pandemic wave. So Korea is suffering from the worst wave of the pandemic despite the tough restrictions across the country that has been standing for a few weeks already now. Mm. Now, KDC Director Chong Gyeong has repeatedly said the peak has yet to come. Mm. I guess that still holds ground. Yeah, I mean, uh, it doesn't really look uh, likely that any moment this pandemic is going to subside. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, daily cases are now well into the 2000s and that trend is set to continue. Uh, This is mainly due to the fast-spreading Delta variant, as well as other variants as well, uh, a lagging vaccination drive, uh, and also many people traveling during the summer holiday as well, and uh, that's not really going to help. And we have a Liberation Day holiday coming Mm -hmm. up. Uh, So uh, authorities are on alert for that. Mm. Now, although the capital region and some other holiday hotspots are under the highest level for distancing rules, the measures are yet uh, having little effect in containing the virus. There's still too much moving happening across the country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And a lot of violations as well of those uh, measures that we should uh, point out. And Mm. experts are calling for tougher measures, uh, in fact, something the government is considering. So we could see some customized measures on top of the level four uh, to help contain the spread Mm. Um, but in the meantime health authorities are urging people to stay at home during the summer especially ahead of the new school semester in a few weeks as well the government Mm. is trying to get students back into in-person classes and there's a lot of debate around that which i won't go into now now authorities expected the virus surge to continue in the coming weeks now a virus dynamics model predicts the daily new cases could rise to around 2500 and even 3000 later this month if the reproduction rate is 1.06 so if it stays above one Mm. uh, and experts agree that the worst is yet to come as well so at the moment for the next couple of months anyway things aren't really looking good unfortunately while the vaccination is trying to ramp up in the country unfortunately the only thing we can do Mm. is what we've been told all these months prior which is to social distance mask up and maybe refrain from a lot of these outdoor activities too yeah, I know the weather's nice and it's getting a lot better now. I it's mean, a little inviting, isn't it? Yeah, that really scorching heat wave is yeah. kind of 
have uh, uh, passed us now, but uh, yeah, I think we should just hold mm. on a little bit longer. All right, on to our third keyword of the day. Vaccine waste. So there has been a lot of controversy over rich nations hoarding COVID-19 vaccines. To make matters worse, reports are coming out that the United States is throwing away hundreds of thousands of doses that have exceeded its expiration date. So tell Mm. us more. Yeah, the vast majority of COVID-19 vaccines have gone straight from drug companies to affluent countries such as the United States. Uh, Worldwide, only about 1% have actually made it to low-income countries. Now, in the U.S., there are millions of vaccine doses that are at risk of spoiling that are sitting on freezer shelves uh, with no easy way to get them to countries desperately waiting for shots. So that's kind of, they're kind of in a pickle at the moment. Uh, in North Carolina, for example, more than half a million Pfizer shots are set to expire by the end of this month. Alabama just threw away 65,000 doses. Last month, Arkansas said it was going to toss 80,000. Now, state health officials warn the current demand for the vaccine may not be enough to get much of the supply into the arms of the people before they reach their expiration dates. This mm-hmm. whole vaccine hesitancy yeah. is why there is a dwindling demand for them. Right. All in all, about 10 states are reported to have thrown away about a million doses so far. Mm. Uh, now, as, a, as apart from the reasons that I mentioned, other reasons for the vaccine wastage include damage, uh, as well as storage and transportation ah. problems, and of course the expiration that we mentioned, and of course uh, shots that were prepared but not used after people did not show up for appointments, these so-called no-shows. Mm. Now, these leftover doses are also not really suitable to be shipped overseas, and therefore needs to to eventually get scrapped, which is a bit unfortunate. It's a bit of a waste. It's actually a great deal of waste, and it does bring to question about this mm. sort of first world problem as to why does vaccine hesitancy even exist? Because mm. they could afford to be hesitant, right? Yeah. And then you take a look at that figure that you just mentioned worldwide, only about 1% having yeah. made it to low income countries. Yeah. Uh, just, to, just to make this point, uh, the, United, the United States is open to sharing its vaccines, of but course. just the whole logistics and the right. uh, the longevity of these vaccines right. simply aren't allowing them to right. be donated overseas because by the time they do reach other countries, lower income countries, they might either expire or not be transported, exactly. or would they have the proper storage yeah. or even the medical infrastructure to inoculate right. its population? So mm. those are also elements that stand in the way. Mm. Right on to our fourth keyword of the day: shipbuilding dominance. So Korea has maintained its status as a shipbuilding powerhouse, maintaining the number one spot in terms of orders. There was a lot of excitement in that delivery. (laughs) Are you proud? No, I was very... (laughs) It's okay to be proud. No, 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 I was... I was being careful on the pronunciation of <laughs> shipbuilding. Ah, <laughs> I see. Because I've made a mistake before. So, yeah. Uh, how unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you enunciated. <laughs> What's the latest on shipbuilding yeah. dominance? Well, Korea is doing very well, and it always has been. Uh, there's been a lot of rivalry from China and Japan, but uh, uh, Korea shipbuilders have defended their number one position in the global order book for the third consecutive month in July. Uh, according to the British shipbuilding and marine industry tracker Clarkson Research, uh, Korean shipyards won orders worth some 8.1 million compensated gross tons. 1.8 million compensated gross 1. tons? 1.8 million, right. yes. Uh, and that's around 45% of all orders placed worldwide. Uh, China was closely behind at 1.77 million, uh, or 44%. Uh, Japan came in third with 400,000 CGTs. Uh, that's around 10% of the worldwide orders. Uh, that's quite a bit of a gap between the third and second right, place. Right. Um, from January to July, Korean shipbuilders has bagged orders worth nearly 12.8 million CGTs. That's mm. the largest, actually, since uh, uh, during the same period in 20, uh, 2008. So, yeah, so things are picking up for them. And, and do you think uh, that, you know, Korea having relatively a manifold mm. stance during the pandemic actually helped them, you know, keep their number one spot, too? Uh, that could be a factor, yeah. Yeah, could all right. Mm. On to our fifth keyword of the day. Summit for Democracy. So U.S. President Joe Biden will convene a virtual Summit for Democracy to discuss a wide range of issues with world leaders. It it seems like there's a bigger agenda at play. What can Mm. we expect? Yeah, the White House says the Summit for Democracy, as it is named, will take place uh, from December 9th and 10th. Uh, Heads of state, members of civil society, philanthropists and representatives from the private sector will be invited 
The conference follows the president's repeated campaign pledge, if we remember, to uh, promote American democracy and also repair relationships with partners and allies that have been kind of undermined under his predecessor, Donald Trump. Mm. Now, the summit will focus on three principal themes, the first being defending against authoritarianism, fighting corruption and promoting respect for human rights. Uh, A year later, Biden plans to host the same people once more, hopefully in person. Uh, Invitations are expected to be sent out in the coming weeks, though a guest list has not been made public yet. Now, the invited group is being seen as kind of an alternative to the group of 20, the G20, Mm. and uh, also a challenge to Beijing. Biden wants to uh, strengthen the alliance uh, with uh, fellow allies and partners Mm. to kind of, you know, rein in China's growing power. Uh, And the leaders of the G20, meanwhile, are actually due to meet at the end of October in Italy as well. So Mm. uh, the U.S is certainly trying to step up efforts to become a world powerhouse. And once more touting their sort of uh, policing of democracy as defined by the United States. All right, on to our last keyword of the day. Canadian businessman jailed. Tensions between Canada and China are set to escalate once more after a Chinese court jailed a Canadian businessman for suspected espionage. So what's the latest on this story? A very complicated issue indeed. Sure. Uh, if there weren't tensions between the US and China, now Canada is also uh, in very tense relations with China at the moment. A, a Dandong court on Wednesday jailed Canadian businessman Michael Spavor for 11 years after finding him guilty of spying. The court also ordered ordered that he be deported, although it's not immediately clear whether that would happen before or after the 11-year prison sentence is served. Usually, China deports uh, convicted criminals after the prison sentence, so the la- uh, the, after the prison sentence served is probably the likely outcome. Now, Spavor has been detained since 2018 after being arrested with fellow Canadian ex-diplomat Michael, um, uh, Michael mm-hmm. Kovrig. It comes as an extradition battle involving Meng Wanzhou, a senior executive at Huawei, takes place in Canada. Critics have accused China of treating both Spavel and Kovrig uh, as political bargaining chips. Um, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the conviction was, quote, absolutely unacceptable and unjust. Mm -hmm. The Foreign Affairs Minister, Mark Garneau, said Canada will appeal the 11-year sentence, saying the ruling lacked fairness and transparency. Mm. Garneau said the government is engaged, actually, in intense discussions with high-level Chinese and American officials to secure uh, the Canadians' release. Uh, But he would not go into the specifics about those conversations. They are still ongoing. Mm. Uh, No agreement has... probably not likely to be met, but mm. uh, con- conversations are going on nonetheless. Thank you very much, Adam, for today's coverage. You're welcome. Have a good one. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.